Welcome back to HVAC training videos. Man, I cut out the other intro just to give us more time with David. I thought that would be great. If we had that extra 30 seconds with David, we'll get an extra bit of knowledge. So one thing here, I know that uh, my buddy Justin is on the show as well. I can see him down there in his little square off the screen. I just want to let you know that I wrote the words Roby forever right here. Just uh, if you haven't tried a Roby tool, please, after the show is done, go purchase one. Uh, the batteries are pretty cheap and try it out. Try their glue gun or their Brad nailer. I just bought one myself. <laughs> it's a running joke. Hey, they're great. They're great. <laughs> Part of the fun of uh, opening the show is seeing the guys off the screen and just saying stuff that they can't answer to. It's fantastic. They will be in here eventually, though. We have Justin Beaver with us tonight and David Richardson. We're going to be talking about system performance. A lot of you guys are like, it's cooling. That is that's our level of system performance. We're going to take it to a new level here tonight. We have a great show for you. I'm not going to ramble on like I do all the time because, frankly, I was later than I normally am, even fashionably late, plus some. So I'm just going to mention real quick, I think we had a new Shop Talk podcast come out yesterday. If you haven't already subscribed to that, if you don't listen to podcasts, give them a try. They're great. Whenever you're working, like if I'm in my shop working, I'll go ahead and throw down some podcasts whenever I'm driving. They're really great to fill in some knowledge holes while you're moving around from call to call. So check those out. We're HVAC Shop Talk Podcast. Also, let me see if I can remember. We don't have an episode of this show next week. So we're going to take a break next week. We'll be back on the 19th with Jamie Kitchen from Dan Foss. Then the following week, we'll have Don Gillis from Emerson. And then we're going to have David Holt from NCI. So that's our next few weeks going into March. And then at that point, I won't prophesize any farther because I may be errant in my prophecy. We don't want to have guests expected that aren't going to be here, but those are for sure they're in stone unless we have some sort of, uh, um, I don't know, you know, the normal things that get in the way of stuff. If someone catches Corona, then that, that's what's going to happen. It's horrible. I shouldn't have said it. I'm sorry about that. But next week we're going to have a hangout, actually old school style hangout for our subscribe star support supporters subscribe star supporters it's very difficult to say say that five times fast so we're gonna have a hangout next week for those guys if you're wondering what that is those are people that just support the show on a monthly basis which you can find that in the description of this video along with about a million other links down there i suggest that when the show's over you hit them all well here's what i suggest when the show's over hit all the links and check them all out Go to Home Depot, buy yourself a Roby tool and a couple batteries. They're pretty cheap. So it's good. And just as good as Milwaukee, I'm going to say that right now. So, I mean, don't even worry about commenting. I'm not going to look at it. So they're just as good as Milwaukee. 
And uh, that's about all I'm going to say right there, guys. We're going to take a little break right here. I'm going to bring the rest of the boys in. We're going to have a nice little conversation. Some of the most important things to an HVAC business owner are communication with your staff and guys in the field, documentation and coverage of liability, and Company Cam is an app that helps you in both of those areas. It helps you communicate with your guys in the field via photography and messaging, and it consolidates all that into one spot. So there's no confusing phone calls and text messages showing up in random location. You have one area, one spot to go to, and it covers your liability. So when your customers come back later and say, this is what I thought you were doing, you can bring out the picture and say, that's exactly what we did. Here's your before, here's your after. Company Cam is a must-have app for every business owner, especially our HVAC guys out there. And what's more, Company Cam is giving away a Yeti cooler to one of the Shop Talk listeners. You can find a link to the website in the description of this video, but it's companycam.com forward slash shop talk. All righty, let's bring the boys in. First, we have Mr. Milwaukee. No, it's not Brent, actually. That's actually who Mr. Milwaukee is. It's Justin Beaver. Is this man with issues? This is the wrong night. What, what's going on? That's right. <laughs> Speaking, Colossians 3. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. Then we're going <laughs> to we're gonna have David Richardson. Welcome to the show, man. You say man with issues, and then I show up. That's exactly right. Hey, speaking of prophecy, here he is, the man with issues himself. No, I'm sure our group here has our fair share of issues, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about good old-fashioned air conditioner Friday night, right? Sounds like a plan, man. Everybody's like, residential yeah. Residential system performance. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Residential system performance, which this was, you know, I like to say that most of the shows are my idea because this is supposedly my show, but this came from you guys. You guys were fired up about this, and I guess, was it you, Justin, who initially had the thought on this? Yeah, so I... uh I took a class with David as the instructor for three days, I believe it was, David, or was it? No, it was four days, right? Yeah, four, four days, and uh, man, it was just a, it was a good course, and I was excited about it, and uh, thought it was something good to talk about on here. I think he's right, that, man. It's a, and you, you thought of David? Yeah. So David, David's the guy you want. Is there no other guy you didn't want Eric to do it? I don't know. I'm joking. Eric. I'm I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. David's <laughs> like, what the heck is this about? I will but, say this, but before we go any further, I don't know this Eric Kaiser that's in the in the chat, but I'm <laughs> oh, a fan. Good, man. I'm a fan already because he says Ryobi makes good tools to throw <laughs> oh, at the wall. So I'm in agreement there. So Eric, <laughs> I like you, bro. Oh my gosh. Let's just look at this. <laughs> this oh my, look at this junk right here. <laughs> oh, Man, he even made an emoji, which I can't bring myself to make, but I have all the power to everybody else who can. I decide I don't respect emojis. I can't do it. So let's get right after it. Let's talk about some system performance. And, you know, when I was making the notes for this show, I didn't know quite what we were going to get into because this wasn't exactly my brainchild. But I knew it would be a fruitful experience for everybody. But this isn't system performances in day one that, at least, David, that's what you were saying. You're talking about measuring system performance when you come back on a system. Uh, no, you can do it on startup. It's the ultimate tool for commissioning, mm -hmm. making sure that you provided what you sold and that and, your designs work. If you're right. doing the whole ACA suite of designs, it's the ultimate way to verify that it actually worked and that you met your room calculations. Now, might the problem be that we might not be doing the ACA suite of designs sometimes? <laughs> if, well, probably. <laughs> so that's what you were saying. Before the show got started, we all have the same conversation. A lot of times in the trade, you'll come along and you'll have an early stage in which you are, you know, you're fired up, but you don't know anything. Even if you you think you're doing a great job, but then you come back and you kind of, in retrospect, you see all the mistakes you made. That's what we were talking yep. about before. That's what mm -hmm. I started to think about. Kind of describe the situation that you had personally before we get into the details. And what you're talking about, there's four levels of consciousness. And that first level of consciousness is unconscious stupidity. You're dumb and you don't know it. And that's that's where we were when we started measuring this stuff. And when we were doing this, it started out with airflow only. I know mean, I've been on many of the shows in the past talking with you guys about airflow and static pressure. And that's where it started out. But back in 2003, 2004-ish, we became introduced to measuring BTUs, which was actually just adding on to airflow temperature and enthalpy measurements. So when we did that, we started to see another level of the performance of the system. 
And those of you that have listened to me talk about this before, there is a big difference between the system and the equipment. So many times in our industry, we've been kind of brainwashed. And we talk about the equipment as the system, and we kind of use those terms vice versa, and they're not the same thing. The equipment is a component of the system, where the system is everything that's attached to it. Grills, registers, ducts, I mean, you name it. Refrigerant lines, condensate, control wiring, everything that makes up and makes a system run. The box is a component of that, of the equipment. So when we're looking at system performance, we're looking at actually what's coming into the condition space. That's what the customer's paying for when they have you install XYZ system. And too many times we focus our attention in the wrong spot. It has to be right at the equipment, but unfortunately we forget and tend to assume that it happens at the system level, which is at the building. So when we started to measure these things, we were seeing stuff that was all over the place. We started figuring out that uh, sometimes you shouldn't measure too close to a cooling coil, these sorts of things. And as I was telling you guys before the the stream, you know, back in, I think it was 2000 five or something they ran a newspaper article on us about you know where we were doing residential air balancing to solve comfort problems and determine performance issues and you know really air is just one piece of the performance puzzle so with what we're going to talk about tonight we were able to add to that and see a completely different level of what was going on with our systems i mean you can even use this stuff to calculate how many btus are coming in through a return duct leak in an attic it's your imagination's the limit on a lot of this stuff so but we're going to break it down real simple, and uh, we'll give you guys some history on where some of this stuff came from and where the future is going to take us with it, because it is, in my opinion, the future of the HVAC industry. Why did you start with airflow initially? I guess at that that's time, you thought was. That, was, that was all there was. Okay, that that's was like the whole there world was. issue. It, it was airflow testing and diagnostics. That was back in 2000. It 2000. was airflow, and it was static pressure. I mean, we, we knew to measure temperatures. But we didn't know to take them and then plug them into formulas and the variables that affected those formulas. So we'll talk a little bit about those here shortly, but we just, we didn't know. So we were doing the best that we could. And sometimes we got great results and other times it was like, you know, this room's still not comfortable. And we're taking a balancing hood and we're measuring. Airflow's right with where it should be. So what else could be wrong? Well, we I know when... Into account the temperature side, the building side, there's other things we didn't take into account because we didn't know. Well, that was one of the big issues I had, especially early on, is I would take all sorts of measurements and just they would be wrong because I would take them wrong and then I would put them together wrong and then I'd get to some. I remember sometimes, that you know, I'd, I'd get like a five ton unit. It's like, well, this thing's putting out 80,000 BTUs. Not quite sure how that <laughs> took place, but I did a great job. Yeah. Because that's like seven tons of cooling almost. Yep. And that's uh, and Justin's been practicing this a lot. He can tell you there's an art to it. I like yeah. to say that it's. I really like to compare it to hitting a baseball. Just because you stick a bat in somebody's hand, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to hit a baseball. Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, in my humble opinion, sucked at baseball. There was an art to it, but he mastered the art of basketball. And mm -hmm. just because you put a test instrument in somebody's hand, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to effectively use it. They need to have the training that goes beyond that and the practice to use it effectively. So that's where those readings, like you had, Zach, like I had... You, know, you have to know what to look for and you have to practice. Otherwise, you won't improve. You don't just grab it and use it the first time and have instant success. But you have to know what you're aiming for. All right, Justin, explain a little bit because he's talking about you got into this stuff here. I guess, you did you get into it recently, really, the way he's talking? No, you no, just uh, been doing it. Yeah, I, I've been doing it for years. But, uh, I mean, I'm guilty of not always applying it um, like you should. But I think the kind of highlighting some of the stuff that David was talking about is uh, we get so wrapped up in, in staring at the box and I, and I'm guilty of it. I'm sure everybody here is guilty of it. You know, you run that service call of um, it's not keeping up or they're not comfortable or whatever the case is. And you check equipment and everything you think everything looks good or, or, or it might, it might be working good. And you go, man, I don't, uh, it's working great. I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, you know, and you start, you start thinking that your customer's crazy or whatever, you know, cause from what you know, everything looks fine. And I think a lot of people forget that the duct system, I think that's just as important as the equipment itself, if not more important. Um, cause you can have the, the highest seer piece of equipment on the market and, and put it in a house, but if it's not on the right duct system, you're doing nothing but wasting money. Um, 
And so I think that's, you know, we can talk about static pressure and all those things and, and, and airflow and all that. But that, that was one of the biggest takeaways um, from David's class recently was, you know, duct temperature loss and gain. Um, actually figuring out how efficiently you are, the system as a whole is operating. Because, um, again, you can buy a 20-seer piece of equipment, but if you've got terrible duct work, you might be getting the efficiency of a 10-seer. Um, and so it don't do no good for that customer to spend, you know, whatever you charge, 15,000, 20,000, 10,000, whatever you, you charge for 20 seer equipment does no good if, if the people aren't benefiting from it. Um, so I, I, I've, I've tried to make it a point to look at a system as a whole and get outside of the box. And I tried to teach my guys the same thing and they've done a really good job of it. Um, uh, the techs at this company, they're, they're selling duck renovations every day. I mean, I, we have, we have an install crew. We could probably keep an install crew busy year round just with, with duck renovations. Wow. And now is that a new thing, Justin, since you've been yes, learning about yes. this stuff? That's, that, that's a, that's a somewhat newer thing. Don't get me wrong. They've, they've, they've been checking static pressure. Um, but that's just one step of it. Right. So, kind of more the formulas from NCI and different things that they're applying everywhere that they go. Now you wouldn't believe the duck renovations that they sell on a daily basis. <clears throat> now, David, that's a, that's like a mirror of what you told me in the past, how you guys came along and once you learned about this stuff, all of a sudden it's this huge extra part of your business model that could bring in so much revenue. Right. Yep. Yep. And like Justin was saying about your duck renovators, you can get a good install guy, teach them how to read what should be there. And it's a great place to get a good installer started at because mm -hmm. it teaches them to look at a system differently. And then once you move them into full installation, they understand a hundred percent why what they're doing makes such a big difference because they've already seen test in and test out results and how much of a difference their work makes. That's one of the things I, I get a little aggravated with our industry sometimes because we, we tend to look down on installation guys and they're the ones like you pointed out earlier, Justin, they determine the performance of an HVAC system, how efficiently and how well it performs more than anybody. It doesn't matter what the yellow tag is stuck on that equipment. The installation team determines its installed efficiency and we got to give them the credit. They're the ones that make the magic happen. Mm -hmm. Now, a great tip if you don't want to ruin your Renault crew, for duck renovations, don't move your service techs over there. That'll ruin the crew. <laughs> the morale will plummet immediately. Yeah. And I and I will say that um, you know, obviously I'm dealing with mostly service techs. Now I do do the training for for the install crews as well, but that's that's uh, one meeting once a week in the morning uh, on Wednesday mornings. Um, but as far as the, the daily operation of install and stuff, I'm not really in the loop on that as much. I'm mostly dealing with service techs. Um, so if they sell a big duck renovation, obviously the service takes probably not the one going back to do it. Install is going to be the one that goes back and does it. And, uh, there for a while they were, you know, nobody likes doing duck work, right? That that's, that's not glorious. No, nobody wants to do that in the South, in, in the South, especially in the South. No one likes it. Yeah. 95 degrees outside 140 in the attic. And you got me going back to do duck work. Why? Um, so nobody likes that. It's not fun. Um, and so they didn't understand why they kept having to go back and do duck work and this and that. So I made it a point to start going over duck work and static pressure and all these things with the installers to get them to understand why they're doing it. Um, and they're seeing happy customers and seeing a difference. And, and now they're, they're starting to understand why we send them back to do these things and, and how it improves system performance. David, when you like attacking the subject, do you start right at the design point for your install? Is that where you would start this whole push towards system performance? If it's brand new, yes. Start with, because it all starts with the design. Make sure you're starting with the right size piece of equipment. If it's on a retrofit, it's a little bit different though. You've got to evaluate what's there. You have to, you really need to start with static pressure. As Justin mentioned, you need to start with the temperatures. You need to evaluate what's there. Because a lot of times you guys have probably gone in. I know I used to go in. I would look at the equipment. It would be way too large for the building. No way that, it, that a, you know, house needs 120,000 BTU furnace. And they're like, 
It works great. And we're like, how do we convince them their equipment's too large? The temperature test that Justin talked about, that's how we started showing them. This is why your oversized furnace works great because you're losing mm-hmm. half of it to a basement, half of it to a crawl space. And if some poor soul goes in there and they are able to convince them to downsize equipment and they don't look at that existing duct system, they automatically assume it's going to work right once they put the properly sized equipment in. They just bought a problem. Mm-hmm. So you have to start with evaluation. And we walk through that in the course of how to test in, see what you have. And then instead of just, most guys think you have to rip everything out. That was kind of the way we used to think about it. You know, rip it out, mm-hmm. start all over. But once you have the measurements, you're able to make surgical repairs on the problem spots. What works, you leave. And I got to tell you, that was one of the biggest hurdles for me to overcome because I'm like, that's sloppy. It needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. But the measurement (laughs) side was like, you know what? It's working though. So leave it. Right. So there's, and I, and I, and I struggle with that too. Um, that's the craftsman in us though. Cause, exactly cause you want to tear is. it all out and redesign the whole thing so that you, that you feel a hundred percent about it. And, and there's, there's something about, I, I've heard Chuck Pierce say it several times, you know, there, there's just something that helps, helps you sleep at night knowing that, that everything is new. Right. Yep. Um, but you can't go into every service call thinking somebody's got the money to replace equipment and duct work all at the same time. Sometimes yep. you have to make parts of the duct system work and renovate what you can in order to make it operate right. Yep. So, okay, let's say you go to this house, you're doing a change out, you test the duct work. Let's say the duct work is, is good. You put in a new system, the duct work is good, everybody's happy. What do the installers need to be doing when they're doing their last test out, when they're done? What do they need to know before they leave that house? Well, with us, we didn't let our installers test. We did the testing. Hey, I thought you said installers were all right. Why won't you? They are. Test they are. But here to Justin's <laughs> point, after they're done sweating it out in an attic, they got yeah. cellulose up their nose, their knees are beat up. The mm-hmm. last thing that they want to do, and this is me just trying to put myself in their shoes. The last thing that they want to do is go, great. Now we got to pull out a balancing hood. Now we got to pull out temperature probes and do all the tests. They just want to go home at that point and relax. Yeah. So someone else went back to commission the system. Yep. So And we reported the results. Because what happens is when you know better, you do better. And when our guys, like you said, Zach, if they did a rocking job, they were told, guys, you did a rocking job. Here's what the results were. And we actually created competition that way. And it worked out. I mean, it's not nothing original to me. I got the idea from Dale Carnegie. But, I mean, it works. And they're like, oh, so such and such crew did this good. We can do better than that. So that tide starts to raise through competition. So Mm -hmm. once they see what the results are. But that's one of the things, Justin, I'm sure you'll say the same thing. It's easy to get lost because we're so busy trying to get done during the day. Everything that we've got to do, we forget to communicate and encourage to the guys that are actually out there how good of a job that they did. It's like, you know, that's your job to get paid to do that. Just go to the next one. But when we were in really telling the guys how well they were doing and what an improvement they made, it's crazy how much of a difference it made in them taking yeah. more pride in their work. And it's really hard. You have to you have to work with what you've got to. Um, you know, everybody would love to have an installer that's been doing it for 25 years and he knows the ins and outs and he could be a jam up service tech if he wanted to run service too. But we all know that's not uh, realistic, at least at least in my area. Um, you know, most of the time you have installers that are fairly young and, you know, they come into the industry of learning how to put the box in, you know, and as far as the technical data, they don't, they don't know a lot of it. I mean, I am guilty of, um, j- just months ago, of uh, slowly trying to teach them. You're not going to teach them this stuff overnight and you have to do it slowly because if you come into a company that has. Um, I won't say green installers, but just not as knowledgeable installers. Um, if you come in and say, I want you to check static pressure. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. They look at it as that. You're just giving me more stuff to do. You know, I'm just trying to get out of an attic by five o'clock and go home. I don't want to do all these other things. Um, so I was guilty of back when I first come back here of, uh, Hey, I'll just tell you train, some of the train air handlers, we were getting the Tim four metal cabinets. They were still coming with PSC blowers. Um, 
those guys would call me at the end of the day, four o'clock, five o'clock, put the blower on medium, make sure it's draining. I'll be there tomorrow to do the QC. No checking static pressure, no nothing. Put the blower on medium, get it draining, make sure it's cooling, get the charge as close as you can get it. I'll be there and I'll straighten it out tomorrow. Sometimes that's the way you have to do things. You know, yep. um, we do QCs. I, I, I still do that. Um, we're working at getting somebody else in that position so I can kind of get away from that and focus on being the service manager. But for the time being, I go behind install and check their stuff. Um, and they're finally getting to a point, you know, they know how to set airflow. They know how to charge a system. They know how to go through all the, the ins and outs. You know, if they if they get up in an attic, they've learned because they were bad about putting systems in on, you know, maybe the salesman missed something on the duct work. Okay. Maybe the return was undersized. And they'd go in there and slap the unit in and it's it's not right, you know. And uh, now they've got to where I've taught them that when you get there and you get up in the attic, Kind of evaluate the situation. Evaluate what's going on. Look at the ductwork. If you're putting in a three and a half ton and you see it's got a 14 inch flex as the return duct, you know that's not right. Call somebody and tell them right then and there so we can get it resolved. Um, so they're getting a whole lot better, but it's it, it's a work in progress. It's like I said, it's not going to be an overnight thing. Um, but the more you talk about it, the more you train on it, the more you start to you know hold people accountable for doing the right things it it gets better and better and it becomes part of daily routine for them and that daily routine is important that's the consistency part mm -hmm. where most companies fall off the bus and we actually fell off the bus for probably a couple of seasons on this because we dropped being consistent we got super slammed in one season and we were like well we don't have time to do this so we kind of backed off a little bit and all of a sudden the guy's like, well, Dave's not telling us to do this now. You know, we're not really keeping track of this, so it must not be important. Mm -hmm. So it was like we had to start all over back in, I think it was like 2004. It was almost like we had to start all over again because we took our foot off the gas, yeah. me specifically. Mm -hmm. So, and you're right, it's a drip campaign. It has to be constant and you have to believe in it. Those of you that are on this, this call, if you're any company owners, if you don't believe in it, Nobody else is going to do it. You got to yeah. believe in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. I want to, I want to ask both of you, uh, David, I know I, I figure I know the answer on this. When the installer slash commissioning agent, whoever that is, leaves the job, should they have a readout or at least some sort of notation on what the capacity was, on what the airflow was? How much information do you need at time of startup? feasible information that guys can get on startup it's going to depend like i said with us we were pretty much like justin our guys get it running we will come back now once we went back to do the test out that's where we were getting the information and depending on what we had sold that customer it would depend on whether they got a complete airflow test or whether we were just commissioning the equipment so it was it depended on the job so let's say that the customer paid just for a regular change out Regular replacement, we didn't do a whole lot of duct modifications, maybe made the return bigger. We're checking temperatures at the equipment. We're doing a couple of temperature checks at the farthest return grill, farthest supply register to get worst case system delta T. We're doing all of our static pressures and we're recording those, especially on air handlers and ground source heat pumps because those coils are internal. So that startup was the only time that I had to be able to get a clean coil pressure drop on them. So and then we were documenting all that and taking it back, seeing where we were, making sure that our airflow and everything was set. However, if that customer paid for full system test out and they got balancing, now we're into a different ball, ball game. Because at that point in time, we have room by room loads. We are checking airflow from each individual supply register. We are adjusting to where we've got plus or minus 10% of design supply air and return air into an individual room. So one of the things that we learned back during the airflow side of this is that if you're not putting balancing dampers in your returns, you're going to have trouble when you start trying to balance a system. Because mm -hmm. we all know one of the first rules of airflow is that air takes the path of least resistance. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my father was the first one I ever saw put balancing dampers in a return. I was like, what are you doing? That's the return. Yeah. And I, in my logic, I was like, that sucks the air, Dad. That doesn't blow it out. You don't need to put dampers there. Yep. But then you realize that the, the return, let's say a three-ton system has... Uh, 
three 12 inch returns flex or pipe or whatever. And one of them's a hundred foot long. And then the other two are 10 foot long. Yeah. Well, he was able to, and that's probably going to be undersized if you damper those down, but just ignore that part of my example. If you don't damper those, at least the, the shorter ones, then that the one down there, the filter is going to stay clean a long time. Yep. And I didn't realize that until I actually saw it play out over several months and checking it. That's what, that's why I want to know. We never had BTU output. I never did that until I owned my own company. I never did it for my father. I mean, I don't even know if my father knew how to calculate BTU out, but he's a smart guy, but I don't know if he'd ever done it before as far as on the job. That's why I'm asking you guys. Justin, I know your company might be newer to this. David's been doing it for a long time. Do either Mm -hmm. of you, when you finish a job, let's say, you commission a system, do you know that three-ton unit was putting out 35,400 BTUs when you leave? I do now, yes. You do now? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I'm, like I said before, I, I'm guilty of not checking those things in the past. Um, but I think you've got to. I think if you're going to be different from your competition, you have to. Um, you, you, you can't take the shortcuts. And if that means that you're going to be, if you have to be three times slower than the average company, then so be it. That's what you're going to have to be. Um, you got to show, you, you got to build the value. There, the value has to be there. Um, and most of the time that means you are going to have to slow down. Like the, I've worked for companies where you run 10, 12 service calls a day or, or your install crew might go slap in two units in one day. Um, I just don't see it. Uh, I would rather, uh, and, and it's hard to do. It's hard to do in the summertime, uh, especially in the South. It's very hard to slow your guys down to say, I only want them to run four service calls a day. Uh, it's dang near impossible unless you've got, unless you've got the manpower. Um, but I hope at some point we're able to get to that point. Um, cause I would like everybody to be able to slow down and everybody thinks, well, if you're only going to run four service calls in a day, uh, you're not going to be very, very profitable. Bull crap. If you're <laughs> able to slow down and build value and test more things, you're going to have a higher average ticket and probably make more money than the company that runs 12 service calls per tech a day. Like you're going to identify more issues if you actually test for issues. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. How obvious is that that no one ever did that coming up early? It's like, I'm not doing all that useless crap. And then all of a sudden you start testing stuff. And why is the temperature, the Delta T four degrees greater than it should be? Mm-hmm. Oh, the return duck five. And I think, too I small. think another. I think another point to that too is, is you have to get the customer involved. You have to, they have to, they have to see it. I I always liked, I always invited the customer to come with me. Um, Now that's not feasible in in South Georgia because 90% of your air handlers are in an attic and, you know, 75 year old man's not going to climb up in the attic with you. Um, But you try to involve them as much as you can and maybe invite them to the condenser with you. Um, But it's good to have equipment. It's really nice, you know, nowadays where we have all this Bluetooth stuff that comes to your phone or to an iPad, because even if you're dealing with an elderly person that's just sitting in the living room the whole time you're there, you can bring it to them and show them and explain stuff to them. Now it's changed from being your opinion to data that they're looking at. You're not lying to them. It's not your opinion. I'm showing this to you. Here's here's what you're going for, and this is what you've got. Um, and I think that changes it big time. Um, and you're not looking like, you know, a salesman just trying to sell them something. I'm going to put on the screen some of our family of smart probes we have out there now. Because when you guys say you can tell them for sure, all these products to one shape, way, shape or form, I think most of these have a typical readout on their apps, or at least the ones on the left do, I know, that they'll tell you either capacity as in the field piece or Testo mm-hmm. calls it cooling power. But yeah. it's the same thing. And they'll actually tell you right there. And you could walk up to somebody and say, hey, that's the actual BTU readout. 12,000 BTUs equals one ton. So you have your three-ton machine putting out three tons. And I think all of them offer out like reports too, if I'm not Mm -hmm. mistaken. I never really use reports. I usually just show them right there in the app or just screenshot or something like that. But I think Mm -hmm. pretty much everything does that now, which makes it a whole lot easier then, right, guys? Because if you have a machine that's going to calculate stuff for you, just put the probes where they're supposed to go, and it'll give you all the information. Now, you were talking about that too, David. Got to make sure you don't put put it right there in the side of the A-coil. 
uh, because of. <laughs> <laughs> like Justin said, you got a three ton unit running at five tons worth of capacity. I've been there. When the the first time that we ever did this, and I wasn't smart enough to figure this stuff out on my own, I learned it. I learned from NCI when I was a contractor. They had what was called their HSER and CSER. It was cooling system efficiency ratio and a heating system efficiency ratio. And it, it's changed now to a system performance score, but the principles are the same. But back then, they we were one of the beta testers for this. And what it involved was going out, measuring our systems, or measuring systems that we were doing what, what we called airflow diagnostics on, where we were troubleshooting comfort problems. People would call us, we'd go out for a set fee, and we'd go out and do our airflow testing. We started adding the measurements that allowed us to get BTUs, and then we compared that to what that equipment was rated to do under laboratory conditions if it was operating at those temperatures and airflow. So basically, you're comparing what the equipment's supposed to do with what it really is doing, and you're creating a score based off that. And just last mm -hmm. year, there was just recently an ASHRAE standard published on how to do that. So now it's there's actually an accredited standard, an ANSI standard, ASHRAE standard, which is it's ASHRAE 221 that walks through the process of this how this is how you do this. So it's not just you know out there anymore. It's it's actually been published. Mm -hmm. But when we were doing this, I mean, the first one that we tested, it came out over a hundred percent, and uh, that was when I found out about the pros being too close. I called Rob Falk. The president of NCI I was like, Rob, this, this doesn't work. I'm over 100%. Something's all screwed up. And he's like, give me your numbers. So I walked in through my numbers. And he was like, there's no way your enthalpy change. And enthalpy is a real fancy <laughs> word for heat. So don't. Wow, nine. That's high. word for heat. Yeah, he was like, I think it was like 10 or something. And he was like, there's no way you're going to have enthalpy change. That I. He said, you're too close to the coil. He said, tell me where you measured. I was like, well, I measure where I drilled my static pressure ports at. And he was like, you're too close. That's so funny. we got out of direct line of sight. All of a sudden, the numbers come in. I'm within like 5% of the equipment's rate of capacity. If you're within 15%, you are you got a rock star duct system. Yeah. And we were within like five. But everything was in a condition space. The ducts were all insulated. So I mean, it was we did our best on it. So that was when I kind of got my introduction to it. And there's even an article. If you guys, you could probably Google search this. It was in uh, Contracting Business back in April 2004. There was a article we wrote about uh, helping determine comfort with a new efficiency rating method or something like that. It was in contracting business and wrote it when I was a contractor with Rob Falk. But that was kind of the where the, a lot of this stuff started to get its steam from. And as I said earlier, we didn't know what we didn't know. And to Justin, to your point, you talked about guys not wanting to do it. And you're right. A lot of guys, they think we're adding something more to them. And yeah. in a way we are, but we're teaching them also how to make their life easier. Mm -hmm. When my guys, when I showed them, and we sometimes we just were our own worst enemies. We tend to overthink and overcomplicate things. Yeah. When I made the guys aware, I was like, you know, you can take these two measurements and figure out if the coil's dirty or not. Yeah. And they were like, say what? To me, I didn't, I didn't think about, you know, that makes your job so much easier. They're like, you mean we don't have to disassemble the whole coal cabinet? It's like, no. Right. They're like, we're in. Mm -hmm. Just simple Absolutely. things like that. This stuff makes your life, no measurement should make your life harder, nor should it harm you. Um, just because you can measure something, it doesn't mean that you should. Every mm -hmm. measurement needs to have an outcome. If it doesn't, don't do it. No. You just, you've crossed the line over into science project land. I think it's worth noting that the, uh, the placement of the probes that you just mentioned in cooling near the coil, being exposed to that radiant cooling is the same in heating. So Absolutely. if you measure it close to a heat exchanger or something like that, you're going to get the same problem. Yep. And a lot of it also has to do with how those sensors and those test instruments read with air velocity and really cold temperatures. It's uh, I forget what the term is. I'm sure somebody smarter than me can figure it out. I just know it messes it up. Don't get it close to them. Well, yeah. put some of the else I'm going to put on the screen. We've been talking about some of the formula, the cooling formula there, and I hope I got that right. Capacity 4.5 CFM Delta H. Delta H is enthalpy. So yep. I don't know why they the make H it. stands for heat. Heat. That's yeah. that's the easiest way to think about it. Yeah. And a lot of guys want to know where that 4.5 comes from. I am, you guys are laughing, point and make fun of me. It took me a long time to figure out where that 4.5 came from because I kept asking and guys, like, we don't know. It just it's a number that you use. If you ever wonder where that comes from, that's a magical number that we use to convert CFM, which BTUs measured on a minutely basis to an hourly basis because that's how heat transfer is measured. That 4.5 is basically the weight of a cubic foot of standard air, which is 0 0.075 times 60 minutes. 
So all that is is just a magic multiplier to get you in into an from a minute rate right into an hourly rate. And there's also so, one for sensible heat too. So would it be fair capacity. to assume? Would it be fair to assume that this is a sea level measurement? Then yes, that's what it's founded on. Okay, that is founded on sea level. So if you are to if you're doing these measurements, say in Denver, four point five goes out the window. You have to account for the weight of air up there. It's just a little bit lighter. <laughs> it's going to be a significant error in your measurement. <laughs> yeah. So you do have you do have to compensate, and a lot of test instruments do that. They'll do what are called actual versus standard measurements. If you put them for actual, sometimes they'll do barometric pressure compensation. There's all kinds of stuff they can do. But it like, gets you an ac more accurate reading than instead of assuming that. And I know a lot of the software will do those calculations as well if you put in what your location is or it's you know, doing it based off a of location. So well, the sensible heat one's airflow times delta T times 1.08. Look at there. Watch brother. him go. Watch That's him why go. I made this show. <laughs> you rock. And the 1.08 is the weight of air times 60 minutes times what for the temperature ranges that we deal with the specific heat of air, which is 0.24. So that's another one of those minute to hour conversions, just a magic number that we use. So I'm going to go ahead. Things, and let, hey, I'm going to let these guys off the hook by saying you don't have to remember that. Just remember the formula. You will, and guys, let me tell you something. You will. It's neat to know where stuff comes from, but this mm -hmm. formula has been on the back of sheet metal rules for years. Mm -hmm. And once, and what, it was like the first thing that we learned in vocational school. And I was like, I don't give a crap about BT about these formulas. Teach me how a compressor works. And teach me how to own one out. And then I learned what these could do once you're able to take them and apply them in the field. That's the magic in these. The principles have been around forever. But taking them and applying them in the fields where the magic happens. Well, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm a curious guy like you, David. And whenever I first saw that there was a standard airflow with an actual airflow, mm -hmm. I was curious about where it came from. And I went all the way to the point where I could calculate it. And let me tell you something. Get a device that calculates it. Unless you want to track <laughs> around like vapor pressure in Nevada, go ahead and get yeah. a device that does it. They do make some <laughs> simple things that you can do off of barometric pressure. There's there's some formulas that you can use for barometric pressure, but like you said, Zach, there's so much stuff that does it for you. Yeah. Don't go down that rabbit trail. It, Unless you're just trying easier. to learn, and that and that's fine. I mean, it was it was nice to be able to know where this stuff comes mm -hmm. from, but yep. when practicality wins over, you know that you had to cut that off. Like you always say about the science project thing, at a certain point you're saying, let me just learn the formula. If you yeah. want to learn it for your curiosity, which I did, that's good but you can get through life without it as well. That's right. Know how to yeah. use it. That's that's the most important thing is know how to use it, know how to apply it and use it correctly. Mm -hmm. It'll uh, it'll make you, like you said, Justin, a lot of happy customers. Yeah. And I think it, uh, especially when you're first starting out and, and and maybe not even when you're first starting out, it maybe maybe years down the road, I still do it to this day. Um, I'm terrible for remembering formulas. Okay, so I, I still keep a folder. Most of it's NCI stuff, so a little plug there. But uh, <laughs> I, I have a I have a folder that's just full of different different stuff. Um, that way, if I'm having a brain fart and I can't remember a formula to a specific thing, or one of my guys calls me and he's doing the same thing, hey, I just grab my folder and I look. I mean, yep. there's so much stuff out there now that. I don't feel like you're going to, you're going to remember everything. Yeah. And I'm, I'm old school. I like a piece of paper in a folder and I got my folder that I can refer to. Yeah. Um, some guys, like some of my guys, they don't, they don't want to keep up with paper or a folder. So they have screenshots of everything on their iPad and they put it in a folder and they just go to their iPad and go to that folder to, to look something up. So however you need to keep up with it, give your, you know, give yourself a way to um, remember it because if, if you're not using it on a daily basis or if you're like me and you struggle with keeping up with formulas, you're not going to use it. That's a great point. I used to keep mine wrote down on the back of my metal clipboard. Yeah. Just wrote them in Sharpie where they were kind of on the inside there. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I had to give my right arm to have some of the stuff that they've got, you know, we've got now that, that didn't exist yeah. back then. Man, you guys but, are uh, old. You're right. That's why we have to go from heating to cooling. We have to refresh ourselves on what we know because we forget your your brain has to shift from heating to cooling mode. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, fellas, let's go to level two now. 
All right. So we're, right. we just talked about capacity, and I put this on the sheet that I sent you, David, and you, Justin. Is there going to be a time and place where we're going to need to separate that from into sensible and latent? For whatever oh, yeah. purpose, diagnostic purposes, perhaps, where mm -hmm. that comes into oh, yeah. play, David? Now, how's that going to happen? Because, you know, there's, we can talk about sensible heat ratio, the ratio between sensible and latent. Basically, what are we talking about in as layman's terms as possible? <laughs> yeah. Good luck, David. And, uh, and don't ever go and talk to your customers and tell them sensible heat ratio. You deserve to be kicked in the corner <laughs> yeah. if you mention sensible yeah. heat no ratio. No customers here. There's no Just, customers here. They don't, they don't care. <laughs> So for practical purposes, and to keep it simple, what sensible heat ratio is, is the percentage of a piece of a cooling equipment's capacity that goes to lowering the space temperature. So when you look at BTU delivery at the grills, that's really sensible cooling because all the latent or the moisture removal side is taking place at the coil. So when you start to look at sensible heat, it's what's going to drop in the space temperature. It's what creates a change in, in temperature that you can feel, where moisture is kind of just changing the moisture content in the air or the latent side. So is that simple enough or you want me to go That farther? is very there's, simple. I'm, there's I'm absolutely one... a reason to do both, especially what? on a hot pull down. And by hot pull down, I'm not talking about the attic access. I'm talking about <laughs> when you start up the equipment and it's 90 degrees inside the house or the building and the humidity levels are off the chart. Because at that point in time, I think this was in your notes too, Zach, is there any time that you shouldn't measure? Mm -hmm. And... If, you're a, if your loads are outside of whack from where they ever would be, or you're trying to measure cooling, like if it's 30 degrees outside or when it's 90 degrees inside, your capacity measurements are going to be all over the place. Mm -hmm. So it can cause you to think that your system's either working a lot better than it really is or worse than it is if you don't account for, for those variables. And there's four that most manufacturers' engineering equipment data takes account for, and that's indoor airflow across the indoor coil, indoor wet bulb across the coil, indoor dry bulb across the coil, and the outdoor temperature. As those four things move, so does the capacity of the equipment. And that's one of the reasons why you can't use a sling psychrometer to check entering wet bulb, because it checks it at the grill or the space, and it doesn't actually check it entering the coil. If you've got a great big honking return duct leak, it's not the same thing. Man, where do we go from here? So on a high humidity, high temperature startup, should you mm -hmm. even consider that the commissioning moment should you not come back after you've gotten to proper condition to do it again let it run mm -hmm. and that's back to justin's point that guys that's just real world you kick yep. the equipment on you let it run you get that customer happy then you come back and you start fine-tuning everything yeah one of the perks of coming back to do a qc at a later time yep mm -hmm. qc slash startup yep so that's what I was thinking, because you, you have this high humidity, high temperature startup. And what's the first thing you're going to see? You're going to see temperature drops that are like 12 or 13 degrees in a house. Like, well, exactly. that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Let me that's slow that blower do down. <laughs> that's why you want to do both. Because I am I was one of the world's worst at this. I would measure delta T at the cooling coil. If it was 16 to 20, I'm rocking. I'm out of there. <laughs> Dave was a yeah. home inspector. <laughs> I did yeah. not. I never used an infrared <laughs> at the registers of the grills, though. <laughs> Let me go out to the condenser. Oh, she's good. Yeah, yeah. She's good. and that could really throw some guys <laughs> off, right? Especially, especially somebody that that knows basics and and they've been taught to shoot for eighteen to twenty or whatever. You got it. And you start up a piece of equipment and it's ninety five degrees in the house, especially here in the south. That's not mm. uncommon. That's actually a a daily thing. I second when, that. Uh, when the air has been off all day, or maybe it's been off for days waiting for the equipment to be installed. In the South, 20 minutes it's been off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you might start it up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's 95 degrees in the house, and guys start checking a split, and it's 14 or 15, and they think that there's mm -hmm. something wrong. Probably not. Uh, you just yep. got to let it get cooled out of the house some. You got to get some of that humidity pulled out. Yep. And yeah. then there's another chance where you're going to go out and that system has been running and you still measure a 14 degree delta T and you're like, all right, something doesn't make sense. Natural reaction is let's go grab some gas. Yep. Let's go grab the magic jug mm -hmm. and let's start throwing some gas to it. Mm -hmm. And instead with just a couple of more measurements, you may be able to find that you've got a whole lot of moisture coming in from say a return duct leak in a crawl space. That somebody missed maybe hand caps Absolutely. off or ducks come disconnected yep 
those sorts of things. So it causes just an, you you nailed this when you said it causes you to look past the equipment to everything that it's connected to. It, yeah. it really does. It changes your perception of everything. And it's one of those things that I'm kind of, uh, you know, we're talking about all these tools that are Bluetooth and they, they calculate all the, you know, BTU output and all this stuff for you now. I'm torn on it. I think it's really great. Um, it makes it a whole lot easier, but I think me and Zach's talked about this in the past. I'm just old school in the way of, of, I want you to understand where that comes from. That's, that's what I teach my guys. I want you to understand how to, how to manually factor all these things. And once I, I know that you understand what you're looking at, um, then if you want to use a tool that makes your job easier, great. But I want you to know where it comes from first and what you're actually testing, you know, because you have things like measure quick now that, you know, it, 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 it'll do diagnostics for you and tell you, you know, based on what they're reading that you have a return duct leakage or, or whatever. And it's like, it, it kind of takes the, I'm afraid it takes some of the technical ability out of, out of text out of it a little bit um, where you don't have to be as technical anymore. You got a, you got an iPad that's telling you what to check and what to do. Um, and that's great. I just, I prefer guys to understand it first. So I'm torn on it a little bit, but it's great tools. It really is. I, I like I your point, having man. That for a, I was going to say, I think having that for a guy that knows what's going into it, having something that does the calculations, it makes their life easier. But if you're a tech that's using that as a crutch to not figure out, you're you're wrong. Because if those readings mm -hmm. are out of whack, you are going to have no idea what to look at first. And that's one of the things we teach in the classes is that if you don't have the BTUs, where do you go first? And it, mm -hmm. it's a much more effective exercise in a live class than it is online. But you have to know your ranges for airflow. You have to know your ranges for temperature and enthalpy. And you start to see what's out of whack, what doesn't fit. And that's where you start to figure out what's affecting that. Why is that yeah. out of whack? Yeah. And, and I think another another point to it is, is you can have all the tools in the world that calculate all kinds of stuff for you. But if you don't understand the ins and outs of it, how are you ever going to break it down for a homeowner into terms that they can understand? Um, you know, they don't understand that stuff. What does that mean? And what you're proposing, how does that benefit me? That's what they want to know. Yep. And if you don't understand what you're looking at, if you don't understand the numbers you're looking at, you're going to have a really hard time having that conversation. And man, that's, <laughs> dude, you just hit on something big there. Because that goes back to why most customers will only pay lower price. Because yep. they typically will resort to one thing that they do understand, and that's dollars. And, and this... I, I was used to be the world's worst. I thought, yeah, I'm a great salesperson. I was great at talking, yeah. but people didn't have any idea what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to take these things and break them down. And Zach, you're talking about, you know, we talked about the score. This is the greatest way you can break down HVAC system performance because in our lingo, we talk about BTUs per hour and capacity and all this stuff. You know, Justin, like you said, customers don't care. What percentage am I getting of what I paid for? If I paid for a 20 series system, what percentage of that am I getting? If I paid for a 95% furnace, what percentage of that am I getting? And mm -hmm. I got to tell you guys, before, if you're not measuring it, you're just guessing. And uh, sometimes they may work great. I've seen some systems that look like dog turds. that They were awesome as far as performance. I've seen others that were masterpieces of sheet metal. Pitiful on the performance side. So unless you test, you you don't know. No. Well, I put it to our chatters out there to see if they had any questions. And Eric has a as a declarative sentence. It's not a question, but uh, he says a tech needs to be able to troubleshoot tools as well as equipment. And that sort of goes into our conversation about if you don't know yep. where things come from, how can you tell when things like your tools are maybe wrong, or you input it, input something wrong, or something came out wrong in any way? Yep. If you don't have the knowledge. How can you tell the difference? And you mm -hmm. got to be able to tell the difference. That's where yeah. I always thought that they give this stuff to like brand new guys. It's like giving like a bazooka to a blind guy or something. He's well fortified, has no idea what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So when whenever like measure quick, it tells you a whole bunch of different things. I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, it'll give you like a series of like flags of varying severities. Yeah. yeah. And it can make inferences based on what you put in, how you measure. So it's just doing it based on what you put in. But the guy in the field with the experience, 
to me, that's the most critical part because that's how the measurements are properly made. Because it's yeah. doing calculations based on your skill level, is what like, I like. Like when I use, if I use Measure Quick on something, um, I like it because everything comes to a screen where you can just flip through screens and and look at everything going on with the system. But right. I feel like a good tech can just look at all those numbers, and he ain't never, he's never got to hit that diagnostic flag on Measure Quick by looking mm-hmm. at the numbers and looking at measurements and stuff. A good tech can look at those numbers and say, "I know what I need to check here." I, they don't rely on, um, how do you put that? I guess um, different algorithms or whatever that they put in there to determine what the diagnostics are. Um, I don't ever even hit that thing. And that's not toot my own horn. I'm just saying that that I think with experience, you don't need somebody to tell you what's wrong with it. Looking at the numbers, you can figure it out. You know, I like everything on one screen. And to Eric's point, talking about the tools, the first time I ever used a balancing hood, this goes back to you know, talking about how, using a baseball bat. The first time I used a balancing hood, I didn't fully understand. Please don't put that picture up. That hood. <laughs> we're not we're uh, talking real balancing hoods here. Is this the CPS flow hood? <laughs> no, I'm just no. Sorry about that. Right, so, oh, I didn't. If you Alan have or. to open a flap to get a measurement on a hood that's designed <laughs> for novice. That's what we have in oh. stock here, David. So, don't be critical. That's what we got. That's, that's what we'll talk about. <laughs> but uh, with a with a balancing hood. I mean, I was chasing 600 CFM of duck leakage that didn't exist. And it was because of how the instrument read and how I was using it. There was a correction factor that needed to be applied. I wasn't applying it. It wasn't the test instrument's fault. It was my fault. I didn't know how to use it. And with any, especially airflow, airflow gets really screwed. You can mess it up with temperature. Airflow, you can definitely mess it up because there's an art to it. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen guys beat up. I know you got a picture of a hot wire anemometer you showed us earlier. Mm-hmm. I have seen guys throw these things under the bus. And then when they hold them, when they show themselves holding the probe to take the measurement, they're holding it like a pencil. So, you know, I mean, it's, you have to use the tool the right way. It's, it's easy and, and lazy to blame the tool. All tools have their pros, all tools have their cons. And it's a matter of knowing what is the pro, what's the con, and then how to overcompensate for them. With any test instrument, there's no such thing as a Swiss Army knife. You can't take one test instrument and make it work for everything. So you have to apply it based on the situation. And I almost gave up on this stuff before I got started because of that with a balancing hood, because the numbers didn't add up. And then once I figured out what was going on, I made the the changes. The hood actually used thermal anemometry. Uh, And what that means is it's very sensitive to temperatures. So we took the temperature equation out of it and we started to, whenever we did balancing work or test in, test out, we, we tested under what's called isothermal conditions. And that's basically, you got the same temperature air going in, same temperature air coming out. And it was crazy how quickly all of our readings came very tighter in tolerance. You also learned how the test instruments work. So the cool thing you're looking for is you're trying to make sure that measurements repeat themselves. Uh, Usually if a measurement repeats itself and it's in line with other measurements, this is getting back to what you were getting at, Justin. If those measurements fall into line with one another, then you're probably probably pretty close. Yeah. Guys, in case but you're you just gotta, wondering what all those words were, stuff. if in case you're just wondering what all those words meant that he just said, you can email him at David <laughs> R at NCIHVAC.com. <laughs> he said a whole bunch of stuff. The only one I really understood was anemometer. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I wanted to go so ahead and put that up. how to use your stuff. There's a bunch of things that uh, affect it. Uh, if you want the best test Please instruments. Email me. Just food for thought. If you want the best test instruments, for everybody needs to get into that. I agree with that, Steve. That's a very good point. Um, Doug says that the profile is key. I think he's going back to measure quick on that one. If you don't yeah. put in the proper profile as far as the efficiency of your evaporator and condenser, you're going to be thrown off right away. And again, that's a, a skill level step right there to recognize what profiles you need to put in. So that's that's not a first day thing. In fact, I think a lot of times you need five or ten years for you going to do that right every time. Yeah. So we're going to work down. We had, we had several questions and comments come through here, so we'll go ahead and work through them. And okay. Brian Merlin said, ASHRAE quality score question mark. That sounds like a David question. Oh, yeah. I'm assuming, Brian, that's about the ASHRAE standard. It's 221, and basically what it does is it rates what the system is doing compared to what it's rated to do in a laboratory environment. And then it, it creates a system performance score. <laughs> so it's a nice, super straightforward method, and uh, it's – you can get it on the ASHRAE store right now. It's there out there go. available. 
Our buddy Eric here is David. What is your most important diagnostic value to acquire on cooling and heating? Man, most mm. important. I got my guess on what David's going to say. Let's see what he says. I'll tell you where I started and I'll give you guys an acronym to remember because it's the only way that I could ever keep any of this stuff straight. It's called PATH. There's a path to performance and that PATH actually stands for four of the things that we're trying to measure that encompass performance. P is pressure as in static pressure. Two is airflow, which is the A. Three, the T is temperature, and the H is heat, which is BTUs. And I think as you start to look at things, that's, in my opinion, the order that it needs to go and that you need to start in. Start with pressure, move to airflow, then jump to temperature. A lot of guys will throw temperature and pressures together. That That's fine. But as far as giving you, you know, pata doesn't flow well. Path works better. So if you throw the temperature in there, then the heat, it works. And there's a, in our magazine, which is free to all you guys, if you want to subscribe to it online, it's called High Performance HVAC Today. I actually wrote a six series articles on path to performance, how to implement this stuff and everything that you guys can look at. You can download it for free, but it's High Performance HVAC Today. It's our magazine from NCI, but it walks through all that process. So <laughs> Eric, if I had to start with one, I'm starting with pressure. That's far as measurements. Now, if I'm going to start with what is my most important thing to do, it's going to involve all my God-given senses, eyes. I'm, I'm going to go in. I'm going to look. I'm going to see what's there. My buddy Vince DeFilippo calls it walking the ship. I'm going to see what's there. I'm going to do a visual inspection. So many times we go and we start measuring first, and we haven't even looked to see if the blower's dirty. So I got to say that just eyes, ears, senses, Justin, you pointed out knowing what to look for. Those are the things that I would start with. Now, measurements, though, I'm probably going to go static first after yeah. I've looked around. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, because if you come back on a house years later, static can be deceptive for several different reasons because of dirty equipment and for other things. Uh, so yeah. you have to do kind Christmas of trees. Saying, walking around <laughs> Christmas trees. <laughs> I think I've told that one before. Static pressure saved my butt on a Christmas tree. But you're probably going to tell it again because those who didn't remember are like, what is he talking about? What does <laughs> this guy do with Christmas? Call cycling on high limit, furnace cycling on high limit. And uh, check static pressure. <laughs> this is off the chart. It wasn't like this last year. Something's no. changed. Anytime your measurements don't add up, something's changed. Look for what changed. Started, uh, and, of course, with the readings, when you the way we teach to take static pressure measurements, you take four of them and you look at the readings individually to see where the pressure's at. And all the pressure for this thing was on the return side. You're like, all right, something's collapsed or something's crawled in the return duct or something. So we start looking around. Christmas tree over the floor return. Yeah. Simple things. It had drove somebody nuts if they hadn't taken the pressure measurements. Commercialism ruins Christmas again. All right. So. Here we have another one for you. Brian Merlin, you talked about showing a homeowner the efficiency of their system. How do you reach that number? Oh, man, that's going to be a different show. Sorry, I didn't realize what contributes That's, to it? Uh, All right. Well, let me just break it down real simple. Uh, we'll just yep. go simple, high level on it, Brian. Uh, you measure all the supply airflow coming out of the supply registers. You measure the average enthalpy change across the registers and cooling. And you basically dump them into the total heat formula. Whatever that measurement comes out to, you compare it against the equipment's rated capacity from, their man from manufacturing engineering data. And whatever that percentage is, that's your score. And uh, it's hard to hit 100%. If you hit 85% on the system because of duct losses and gains and duct leakage and that sort of stuff. And guys, that's on an HVAC system, that's where the rubber meets the road. You can do all the design work that you want all day long. When you measure, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's what proves that the design actually worked. And I'm going to so read I that out. That, Cooling I capacity. That answers your question. It's uh, 4.5 times CFM times delta H. Again, H yep. stands for of course, heat. CFM's airflow. Absolutely. So I just want to read that out for people who listen on a podcast later. I don't know if we read it out. I think we discussed through it last time, but I'm not sure. We'll go back to the comments. I think we had another one. Let's see. I thought you were starting to, I thought you were going to break down into EER. I was like, I thought we were waiting on EER. So, okay. But you didn't do that. No, so. not that. Now that's <laughs> another show because that's when you start looking at the amount of energy it takes versus the BTUs that you're getting for that completely different discussion. So there's some additional measurements that, of course, this is on the air side. But thought on clocking the gas meter, setting the input, settings at three and a half, and running with that. 
uh, measure the output. See what it comes up to. You can definitely start with measuring the clock on the gas meter. <clears throat> if you don't have the input to start with, there's no way in the world you're going to get the output. But verify it. Because what a lot of guys will do is they'll take and they'll clock the gas meter at the input, and then they'll assume because of the efficiency rating on the equipment that it's automatically producing that amount of BTU output. And that's not always the case. So you want to make sure that when you do your measurements that you're actually determining what the real output of the furnace is. And CFM Delta T 1.08 will tell you that. And then you can compare that against what the nameplate rating output is. So there's that formula again. Sensible heat is CFM times Delta T times 1.08. That will tell you how much output that furnace is doing. You compare that to what the rating plate says it should be, and that'll tell you a lot right there. And the but reason definitely use, make sure you've got the input. And the reason you use delta T instead of delta H is because delta H takes into account latent heat as well. Yes, okay. yes, that's total heat. That, I think that so what is it? Q per pound. I've, I've spent a lot oh, of time on engineering of toolbox. That we can complicate it. You know, there's all kinds of ways <laughs> that you can complicate it. It's a it's a Q, as I recall. Some kind of Q. Yeah, I'm not using Qs. <laughs> I just I got to spell it out, guys. I, I have went, to. I don't know why. If we got an H, we got to use a Q too. I don't. I don't know why that would be. But uh, because there has to be a page full of accompanying definitions to go with. We we like to complicate <laughs> things. That's when you know you've gone I mean, too far. We just do. I mean, I'm showing guys how to troubleshoot combustion air with a piece of toilet paper and then fix it with a five gallon bucket. <laughs> Can it be that simple? Yes. Well, that's nice. I like that. We that make makes it sound hard. more attainable, David. It is. We we make it hard. And the reason that we do that is so we'll procrastinate for not taking the measurements. <laughs> or we'll uh, try yes, to convince ourselves that they, uh, well, those those readings don't add up. I'm not going to do that. Dig. Ask why. Why don't they add up? What's up? What's causing that? And don't take anybody's word for it. Go out and test. Just because you're listening to us talk about this stuff, don't take my word for it. Go out and test for yourself. Well, then email I... me. Yep, I was about to say, there's the email for David. If you want to email him, David R at NCIHVAC.com. If you also want to know what kind of restaurants are in Chicken Spoke, Georgia, you can email Justin at justin.kyle.beaver at gmail.com. Uh, the running joke is that both Justin and I live in very small towns. Uh, I live in a town uh, right north of, of town, Burgaw is where I live. He lives in a place, and I'm not going to say the name of this place if you don't want people to say it, but I call it Chicken Spoke. Because it, I think it suits it. No, nah, I don't care. Look it up, Nahuna, Georgia. I mean, it doesn't appear on any any yeah, actual very, map. Very very small speck in the southeast corner of Georgia. So, it's one of those towns that has one red light, and uh, you'll blink. If you blink, you'll miss it. So, well, here's how you we find have wild it. turkey and four roses. So, hey, <laughs> wild turkey. You have towns named after liquor, man. That's that's definitely the south. I'll tell you what. Well, here's how you find Justin South. If you see me, you go south. You've gone too far north. If you see Brian Orr, go north. You've gone too far south. If you That's see exactly Tersh, right. go east because you've gone too far west. <laughs> all, all fun people to be around. Let me see if we have any more. Uh, oh, your wife's in the chat, Justin. That's always fun. Don't say anything stupid. All right. What's she say? We have six. I don't know what she's talking about. We have six. I guess that's restaurants in Chicken Oh, Spoke. Wow. That's a whole bunch. And Carl's Jr. doesn't count. So if she's counting Carl's Jr., it doesn't count. Yeah. Not to offend them or anything like that. Okay. I know we've been going for a while here. I think we've educated people heavily tonight, and they're probably near their tipping point. Is there anything <laughs> either one of you would like to say that we have not said so far? I know we hit most of the points. Either one of you. This is your soapbox. Go ahead and talk. Ahead, I like David. that. There's no words at all. <laughs> I wasn't going to be rude. I talk too much anyway. Well, I'll go ahead and talk. Anna says, yes, restaurants. There's mm. six restaurants. Three of them are Hardee's. One's a Carl's Jr. I don't know how that no, worked out. Neither. <laughs> neither. Most of them are mom and pop places. Well, that's good. Uh, that's good. No, I was just going to say, and not, you know, David can talk on NCI more than more than I can, obviously. But I, I was just going to say, if if you question it or or you want more information, check honestly check out NCI. There's there's tons of information on there. There, there there's all kinds of paperwork for training. Um, uh, even uh, 
God, what am I trying to say here? Um, I'm having a brain fart. Oh, forms for, um, you know, what to check during service calls, things like that. Um, uh, the common question of that homeowners give you of what filter should I use? Um, there's forms on there to show you how to calculate what filter they can use in their house. Um, there's all kinds of good information on there. Um, consider looking into that and apply it. Try it. Um, don't take our word for it. Use it and you'll see the difference. One of the things, too, that uh, we've got is translation pieces on there that help with so one of the problems we talked about earlier, which is how do you take this and you make it simple to where somebody can understand it. Uh, with the residential system performance piece of this, guys, what I, what I really want you guys to take away from this is that you determine the efficiency of the system. Your installations do. And what residential system performance does is it gives you a way to create your own yellow label. It gives you the way to score an installation and to show that that customer is getting what they're paying for. One, it's always been a challenge. You know, everybody thinks they're getting this piece of efficiency equipment. Now you can prove it. Here's what's cool. You can prove how good your stuff works. You can also find the defects in your competition's work and then recommend repairs. We used to have competition that they were like, why are you guys tearing our duct work out and sticking it out in the front yard? We were almost evil about this because we had a point to prove. But that was why, because we would go out, we could do the testing, and that was what we would find. Uh, Power Factor, I hear you, brother. The only thing I've been doing is online or uh, on sites for CO. We probably will not do CO online unless it's research. Um, but I have been doing on sites for 10 people or less. And that's and that's totally off topic, but I was just going to ask you, David, and I, don't, and I don't know if you even know, but uh, any any light at the end of the tunnel as far as going back to, to in-person stuff? Not until the distributors start to let, open things up and let us back in. As soon as they do, we're there. As of right now, what I've been doing is working with companies privately. So, mm -hmm. Zach, you can throw this out there to your listeners. If you guys want to get a group together, 10 people or whatever, then uh, I'd be glad to come talk to you guys about this. Uh, what Marshall, should they do? Tennessee last week, uh, email me and I will get you in touch with the right people to make Man. that happen. Now, you mentioned Brian earlier. I'm actually going to be at his event next month. And I will be talking about combustion air and anything else anybody wants to talk about. So I've got one session. Uh, the rest of the time, I'm, I'm just going to be hanging out. So if you can, anybody that's listening to this is going to be there, look me up. We have uh, a few listeners that will are. Be in the, the first day I will be in plain clothes. Uh, you'll you'll see what I'm well, like normally like. And then the next day, though, I'll be in NCI garb. We need to get you down to chicken spoke. <laughs> Right. We don't want him hey, doubling the population. That uh, <laughs> we can make that happen. Chickens, but, but I don't know, I don't know if you can. Able to, that's the only way I've been able to get out, guys, and do the CO training. No. Is for companies bringing me in. I'm heading no, shut, to shut. Columbia, I'm Columbia, Missouri right. next week. Hey, uh, where is the convention center in Nahanta? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Shut your mouth. I, I will say this: <laughs> you are limited on what you can eat. There is no entertainment, and uh, if you need a hotel room, it's at least twenty miles away. So uh, <laughs> there's that. Hey, you had to get an Airbnb. <laughs> we'll set you up a cot. And you can spend the night in the office. <laughs> yeah, you can spend the night on the Shroot Farm when you go down there. It'll be nice. That's hilarious. Yeah, you're going to go to the neighboring town of uh, Wagon Wheel or something like that. I it's Brunswick. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's familiar. Well, a lot of people are familiar with Jekyll Island and St. Simon's Island and Sea mm -hmm. Island. Okay. It's it's over there. Okay. We're not completely detached from society. Okay. Hey, I, I'll tell you what. Since we're, you know, we were talking about Brian. Brian did invite me to go down there. He said I could do whatever. I, here, here's how he invited me. He's like, "Why don't you come down? There? You can do whatever you want. You can wander around and stream live or whatever you want to do." I was like, "I don't know what that even means. I'm just gonna have like uh, just wander around like interviewing people, <laughs> which actually sounds fun." But I'm gonna I'm gonna send him a message. Said I'm not coming unless Justin Beaver goes. I need Justin Beaver to have a ticket and a hotel room and his whole family and everything. So that's what I'm gonna tell him. Or see, yeah, he's in that. what Orlando. Orlando, right down the street. That ain't that far. That ain't that bad. No, nah, I'm probably not going to go there. 
you know. <laughs> nah, I mean that's a that's a lot of that's a big uh, gregarious style event. I don't do those. I stay here on the internet where I'm safe and alone. Don't be that guy. You that sounds sad, doesn't it? Be yeah. sociable. No, I went to AHR. That was fun. There was about a zillion people packed into that building. If you can do AHR, you can do any event. Yeah. It would be fun. I like to see AK just to prove that he's still alive and stuff. So that would be nice. Hey man, he's made he's been making videos for for Navac. I've that seen him been, on. on he could have made that a year ago. Nah, it looks like it's more recent. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, all right, guys. We're you know obviously if we're talking about AK and Brian, this show has fizzled out. Where right? we're talking about other social media. <laughs> has everybody now. gone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody's filing out of the building. Says we can just watch those guys if we want to, and uh, they all left. So I'm just gonna do the part where I thank you guys. Since there's multiples of you now, and I guess if it's up to Andy Holt and David Holt, we're going to do groups of 10 here coming up soon or whatever, sitting around the outdoor uh, you campfire or whatever he was talking about. It sounded fun. But uh, Justin, thank you for stopping by. If you guys like Justin and his cool hat, you could probably see it again on Sunday when we do Men With Issues. <laughs> <laughs> and that will have nothing to do with HVAC. And uh, yeah, just bring your Bible and get ready. That's all I got to tell you. So thanks for coming by, Justin. Yep. And Justin was gone just like, all right, David, thank you for coming by too. I mean, you're, you can watch men with issues as well. Absolutely. Um, Appreciate Justin bringing up the recommendation for this topic. It was fun. And there's a lot, I mean, there's more we can talk about. Anybody that's interested, email me. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and sign you up for EER in the, maybe at the end of March or early April. How's that sound? It'll probably need to be middle of April. Middle I, of uh, April. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm right ready to get really, really busy. That's right. We worked that out. I'll shoot for you know a couple months from now. That'll be good. And I just want to thank Love you for it. coming by, guys. Uh, I put up the links on the screen. Check out the hbactoday.com. So you can check that out too. Uh, a lot of you probably didn't know about that. So you can. And that was a free resource, correct? Yep. Yep. So excellent. Digital magazine. Thank you for coming by, David. I'm gonna let you go now. All right, man. Appreciate it, Zach. Take care, brother. Take take it easy. All right, guys. So I don't think anyone else had any more questions. Not that I could answer them anyway, because the guys that could answer them just left. Oh, uh, look, there was a couple more questions. Oh, look at that. Hold on a second. Poof, poof. I can bring you guys back for a second. Look hey, at Ross that. back. I was checking my phone, uh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't <laughs> undress yet, David. Don't undress yet. Okay. <laughs> oh, <heck on. laughs> uh, everybody's like, soup. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's saw uh, something good. All right, here we go. I thought it was good. Brian, a good start for service managers troubleshooting. Now, I guess Ooh. that's referring to separating the technician from the service manager. Do we have a service manager here? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Well, as soon as they find someone to fill your old position, we do, I guess. So is there any tips either one of you guys have in this area? Just so we can hit them real quick, because the guys popped the comment in there and I missed it. I guess I guess I'm confused as, as to what he's asking. A good start for service managers troubleshooting that is it. I hope maybe he will clarify that a little bit well in the meantime let's see is the refrigerant side performance class from nci a good or a gog d ppp uh let me just put it this way hmm. i start in two weeks converting it to an online class and there will be a tremendous amount of videos in it as least at least as we have planned so i can't promise but it's supposed to be a lot of planning there'll be a lot of demonstration i think you guys will will like it it's besides the airside stuff it's been the funnest class i've ever put together so i i like it i'm kind of partial to it but it, it brings well, in the the one fluid flow that we've kind of had missing in our training for a long time so we're gonna bring it online eventually that class will go live across the country oh good question then brian that's the same guy to ask the last question that was murky you yep. So on the uh, Eric says, "Look up to comments." I don't see, but this. So I'm not sure what that means. So we'll let that go. All right. As far as the service manager one, if I want to, I'll take a stab at it. Go if ahead. you're trying to get your guys started on where do you start with this, mm. this is going to sound really simple, and I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, but where my guys struggled the most was putting a drill in their hand and actually drilling a hole in a piece of equipment getting past that fear. Mm -hmm. What do you think that fear is? <laughs> it's this the heat exchanger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, oh, that equipment. That's, yeah. that's the fear. Mm -hmm. And if you can get guys past that hump of how to install a test port, how to drill a hole in the equipment and where to drill it, 
knowing where's a good spot and where's a bad spot. That really, in my opinion, is step number one. Teach them where to install the test ports. And mm -hmm. then start teaching them how to do a visual inspection, the things that get in the way of the measurements being accurate to begin with. Then teach them how to measure. So many times we start with measurement and we forget all the why leading up to it. So that, that would be my suggestion, Brian, to start there. Start with and give them a beater piece of equipment. I think we've talked about this in the past on the show. Uh, old duck work. I think I was the first guy ever in the history to drill a square hole. It happens. But it's important to figure out why. Wait a so second. You, you said you just drilled a square drill, hole? I did. And it had a big meat hook hanging off of it. Hmm. It was ugly, man. Wait a it second. It hurt you. I, I had a couple pictures, and I know the people in the podcast won't be able to see these, but I feel like I, I got to use these. These are systems that David approved. There's this <laughs> one right here. He said this was classic uh, Aka Manual D prowess. <laughs> I think it's not just kidding, of course. I'm, I'm showing a picture of uh, what looks like some kind of black flex convention next to a metal box. <laughs> and uh, it looks like uh, airflow was an afterthought. And then we have bad duck system number two. Now, if you tilt your head slightly to the right, it looks like it's level. And I suggest you do that. Otherwise, it's going to bother you. Funnel was included with the installation. <laughs> I <t> <laughs> Yeah, uh, the funnel. Yes. That's excellent. I didn't notice uh, that till now. I didn't either. I mean, I can't believe I didn't notice the funnel. Oh, that's great. Hey, man, and who said flex gas line doesn't look good when you're done? They're crazy. But at least they have good lighting in there. How about that jerk leg? You think that's working? You think that's working right? I don't, I don't know if there's a good change of direction at that drip leg. There is not. <laughs> oh well, that's train for you right there. They'll blame the that's unit inventory, on that. Inventory guys. Yeah, yep. that hammer is going. Train ain't worth a darn. <laughs> All right, and then here's a flex I ran the other day. I'm just going to put that up there. You better stop it. <laughs> now I was just going to hit on uh, as far as the whole service manager thing. Yeah, assuming that's uh, that's what he was asking, you know, where to start um, to kind of hit on what what David said. Yeah, I, I think definitely static pressure is where you start, and knowing what what your budgets are when you test, you know, what what is allowable and what isn't, and, and go from there. But I, I I think it definitely starts at static, understanding what that means once you have that number. Um, and where you need to go from there. Yep. And you need to be consistent. Uh, we talked, we discussed that a little bit earlier. If you're going to do this, they need to see that you believe in it and that you're going to require it on each call. It becomes a change in culture. And the easiest way we've had our guys understand why it was important is we just use doctor's office analogies. I know Rob Falk introduced us to static pressure as blood pressure two decades ago, and it stuck. So, Think about any time you go to the doctor's office. They do it every time. Performance measurements are the same way. What we're doing, though, is we're kind of reprogramming ourselves because we've become so accustomed to going out and slapping a set of gauges on first thing mm -hmm. before we do anything else. So I'm, I would encourage you to help your guys look a little bit differently instead of gauging up first, maybe look at the air side first yeah. and kind of change the way that they're looking at things. You'll, you, they'll be amazed. They'll see things that no other technicians, no other company's ever seen. Yeah. Consider talking to your boss and see if he'll sign you up for an NCI class. I mean, honestly, I, I wasn't expecting it. Um, you know, my boss signed me up for it to basically be the gopher to learn things and, and, you know, pass it on to everybody else. And I wasn't expecting it. Um, I didn't show these earlier or whatever, but before, before you ever take the class, you get a field reference guide in the mail and also a huge thick curriculum book to go through the class with, I mean, and, and you have this stuff, you keep this stuff. So if you forget anything, cause it's a lot of information in four days to try to keep up with, um, you've got it right here in a book. You got a field reference guide that you can keep in your van and, and always refer back to different formulas, what your budgets are, how to calculate stuff. You know, all, all your BTU calculations and stuff are in there. Um, maybe you need a, uh, generic, uh, fan table for, you know, you don't, you don't have, how many times have you went up on a piece of equipment and, uh, you know, your, your fan table is not there. You have no idea. They didn't leave the book sitting on top of the air handler or whatever. And you have no idea based on the static pressure, what supposedly that blower is moving. You have no idea. They have charts, you know, generic charts based on static pressure that will help you get in the ballpark of, of, of what you're moving. So 
how I consider it. I think I've plugged NCI enough now. I'll shut up. <laughs> you did a better job than I could. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Hey, look, they got Goodman on their site. Hmm. I'm just kidding. Hmm. I'm joking. Stuff. I'm joking. <laughs> they sponsor a lot of stuff. Good old Goodman. I'm just going to stop now. <laughs> NCI is good stuff, though. Don't well, that's fine. <laughs> Let me put another comment on the screen. HVAC Residential Basic says, David, what's your favorite meter to measure static pressure? Hey, I already know right here. I can just assume it's going to be probably the HTI dual port manometer. It's a, uh, I got to tell you, I always, <laughs> I don't know what an HTI is. It looks like a nice manometer. It's hey, basically just, the, it's, it's the Ryobi of <laughs> manometers. <laughs> Come on, this is the shame. This is this is a sham right here. This is not Roby at all. No, just take a look at it now. Squint and pretend it's Subco because it's the exact same meter, except yeah. in a different by a different name up top. It is. So, but yeah, Roby's probably pretty accurate as far as describing that. It's. Uh, I got to tell you, when I was in the field, we used the Magna Helix, a one inch Magna Helix, and we also used Testo had a little digital digital manometer called I think it was a five ten. That was yeah. what all of our guys had. If I was back in the field today, I would be using the Bluetooth probes. I, I really like the Testo ones. I like the field piece. And field pieces, having their single one, has they've done some incredible stuff with it. Um, i got to tell you, i probably go Bluetooth probes for everything. That's the 510 you That's the one that to? we used to use. It was a great little manometer. Uh, the field piece one, we used it a lot in the training classes just because it shows the measurements and it'll also show differential on one display mm -hmm. but test instruments have come so far it's it's not even funny and i th uh, and i think it, you got to figure out what works for you too because definitely i you know i have a a, a field piece dual port manometer that has the uh pressure switch tester on it i forget what the number what the model number is on that great manometer but it's big Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Similar to what you got there on the screen. Yeah. Um, it's big. It's, it's not, it's kind of big and bulky. It's really not something you're going to put in a hand tools bag. You're going to have a separate bag for that or a separate mm -hmm. box for that. So I think that's where the Bluetooth, the field piece probes are a lot, a lot smaller. You know, you can put them in a, in a probes bag and it become part of your regular tool bag or like that Testo one that he was showing a minute ago. It's very small. It's, it's tiny. Yeah. I mean, you could put that in your pocket if you had to. Yep. Um, so you got to figure out what works best for you and what's a quality tool. And put it together a kit. Keep it yep. keep it all in one spot. So you've mm -hmm. got pressure tips, your tubing, everything. David needs a DG8. It's, hey, I'm all for that. Now I do have They're a little bit more expensive. Yeah. I got. Let me take you guys down a trip down memory lane because we're we're talking about a different type of manometer. This is what I was using for a long time. Is that a calculator? It's a DG seven hundred. It's what it looks like, doesn't it? Look at a kid's calculator. It's a TI eighty seven. What do you say? Micro manometer. It's a DG seven hundred <laughs> made by Energy Conservatory, and we used to use that more for building pressures, blower door testing, than we did anything. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit overkill for static pressure because I don't need to know the static pressure four decimal places out, but for building pressures, it it's the only test instrument. This is DG8. the eight. I guess oh, isn't this is that a, cool? I think that because there's a few of them here. There's a few different ones here. It says DG, DG8 because uh, Steve was on the show last week and he said mm -hmm. it's a I thought it was a single port manometer, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. But well, and with any test stuff. instrument, you guys know this: you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. You if you make a minimal investment, you'll probably get a minimal test instrument. Yeah, but I agree. You should you should make different kits based on what you need. You know. Yep. Um, power factor in the in the comments that you know go buy a case from harbor freight i, I have a couple of those they, they have those yes. hard cases from harbor freight i think they're apache is what they're called that's what my dual port manometer is in there right go. now there you go with static pressure probes with everything to check gas pressure um it, it's all there or i can just grab that and go whether i'm whether i'm setting gas pressure or i'm checking static pressure it don't matter i'm ready to go they're nice they, they really are nice cases. Mm -hmm. This is just a recorder, but it's sort of like how your instrument would look in there. Whatever you choose to put in there. And there's bigger ones, much bigger ones than this, too. Yeah. They're nice. They're, I don't know. I've, I've never, I think I did. I had a Pelican case because the Sporlin Smart Probes came in a Pelican case. And there ain't a whole lot of difference between this and that. And it's a lot cheaper. 
Yeah. Now that, I've got a large Pelican travel case that I carry all my combustion stuff in when I, I travel, and it, it was a pretty penny. Yeah. But the ones at Harbor Freight, there's no difference. I mean, yeah, there, no. there might be subtle differences, but not for yeah. money. Yeah. For what, you're, for what you're doing with it, yeah. Yeah, a lot of stuff at Harbor Freight's exactly the same as all the other stuff. Would you say that, too? No. <laughs> I, just, I just want to see. But the cases are good. The cases are good. And it's it drops off. what outside. you get from Harbor Freight. Electrical tape, zip ties, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Liquid, gotcha. liquid tape. Oh, yeah. Uh, power tools. No. Nah. <laughs> well, I got that Bauer drill, and I'm going to just tell you that it is not as good as other drills. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Other drills are typically better. All right. Uh, let's wrap this up. <laughs> Hey, look, this is oh, this man, is the quarter till 10. Eric says very high quality. No doubt he's referring to this show. Very high quality. And then Doug also agrees. It's high quality. Referring to this show. Don't read up any higher. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm going to let you guys go for real this time. We had a couple more comments. I enjoyed. You know, a couple people came back and watched. That's so really nice. Cool. So I'm going to say goodbye again. This time it's going to be more brief as this is the second time. So I'm just going to go, Justin, see you later. David, take it easy. And just like that, they were gone. All right, guys, I'm going to take a quick break, and then I'm going to have a couple party words. It's going to be a couple. It's not going to be a whole lot. I'm going to tell you that much right now. And uh, <laughs> let me see right here. Let me check our little list here, make sure we got everything. Yep, we sure did. All right, I'll be right back. We'll have a couple more words, and we'll call it a night. The best forced air zoning controls in the HVAC industry come from EWC Controls. This includes the Workhorse BM Plus 3000 zone panel, three zones, multiple dip switches so you can customize the controls to your particular system install. Another workhorse of the system is the URD and ND dampers. These power open, power closed dampers are both reliable and long lasting. So for the entire life of your system, you won't be replacing your zoning components. And lastly, the innovative SBD2 static pressure bypass with the wireless NFC interface. Take this whole thing to a new level of precision and reliability because you can set your system right there at your fingertips to the particular static pressure you need. No more guesswork, no more barometric arms. Go to EWC Controls Incorporated. You can find them online to learn more and look for them in your local supply house. Guys, I appreciate you watching the show. Craig says Zach should come to symposium. You know, it really is not my thing to be in a huge group of people just doing stuff like that. I, I did come to it before. And I, I did have a good time. But typically, you know, a good day for me is going out into the shop and building something or cutting something in half. And yes, it's a lot of Ryobi tools and I like using them, but there's also some high quality skill tools. <laughs> uh, I, just, I just know people are laughing out there. Hey, wait, someone, someone texting me. I just told David, sorry, we kept him too long out there talking and talking and talking. Guys, I appreciate it. Check out the HVAC Shop Talk podcast. There's a whole bunch of links in the description. Go hit all those links. If you enjoyed this show, give the video a like. I don't know what that does, but it does something positive. People on YouTube say, so please do that if you like the show. If you haven't subscribed, please do that as well. Subscribe to the channel. And we're going to be back again two weeks from now. Next week, we're going to take a week off. I'm going to do a hangout with my fellow subscribe star subscribers over on the HVAC Shop Talk channel. We have a few of that, those guys right now in the chat, like our buddy Steve. There he is. Oh, look, there's only 200 tickets to the symposium. Brian's trying to cause a riot. Thanks a lot, Brian. All right, guys, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Thank you for watching. If you have any ideas or suggestions for the show, you can email me at hvacshoptalk at gmail.com, and I will see you guys on the next one. Mm -hmm.